Hello, it's Dr. Omine. So um, we had started the second cranial now, but I think I'll take you um, back so that we have some thought. So the second cranial nerve is optic nerve, is for vision, and it's usually an outgrowth from the diencephalon. It originates from the ganglionic cells of the retina. So the retina has three neurons that synapse. We have photoreceptors, bipolar neurons, and ganglion cells in that order. And it's from the ganglion cells, the retinal ganglion cells that form the optic nerve. Then the optic nerve, you have the fibers from the inner uh, uh, portion or the nasal portion of the optic nerve that will decussate and form optic chiasma. So these are the three nerves that synapse and transmit signals within the retina. So light will get to the photoreceptors, photoreceptor synapse with bipolar neurons, bipolar with the ganglion, and it's this ganglion that form your optic nerve. So optic nerves are formed from retinal ganglion cells. So then from the optic nerve, the nasal fibers will decussate and form optic chiasma. And from optic chiasma, you have your optic tract, which projects into three areas. The lateral geniculate body, which is on the posterior part of the thalamus, and from lateral geniculate body, fibers form optic radiation. They pass through the retrolentiform part of the internal capsule into the primary visual area, which is located on the banks of the calcarine sulcus. That's a striate cortex. Then the optic tract can also project into the pretectal nucleus that's responsible for accommodation and light reflex. Accommodation is how the eyes are able to adjust to near vision. Okay. Then we have superior colliculi. Optic tracts can project into superior colliculi, which are responsible for the light reflexes. So you can see if light is coming this way, usually there is the cross of the visual field. This, its own visual field, this one has its own visual field. And the visual field has a nasal part and temporal part. So this temporal part of the visual field, light comes this way into nasal part of the eye. And from nasal part of the visual field, it goes into the temple. Then this temporal part of the retina will be carried on the lateral aspect, while from the nasal part of the retina, carrying from temporal of the visual field, temporal of visual field to nasal of retina. Temporal visual field, temporal is the outer portion of visual field to nasal of retina. So from the nasal part of the retina, the fibers pass on the medial aspect of the optic nerve and come to decassette or cross at the midline at the chiasma. But fibers that are coming from the nasal part of the visual field, from nasal part of this visual field for this eye, they go to temporal part of the retina, they don't decussate. From nasal part of this visual field to temporal part of the retina, these fibers don't decussate, so they continue in the optic tract. So an optic tract is carrying fibers from temporal part of um, um, ipsilateral retina and nasal part of contralateral retina. So this optic tract is carrying fibers from both eyes but from different parts of the visual field. Then from optic tract they go to the lateral geniculate body mainly through optic radiation that will carry uh, the information into the primary visual center. We already discussed parts of optic nerve. The one within the eyeball is the intraocular. Then within the orbits is the intraorbital. At the optic canal is the canaliculi and in the skull in the um, cranial fossa is the intracranial portion of the optic nerve. So what are the causes of injury to optic nerve? You can have trauma. As you fracture the skull, you affect the optic nerve. You can have a tumor that's compressing the nerve. And at the optic chiasma, remember it's at the midline. If you have surgery within the sphenoid sinus or a tumor of the pituitary gland, which sits on the um, cellar tosica that's on the body of sphenoid, this can affect the optic chiasma. So these are the causes of injury to the optic nerve. And these lesions will lead to, if you affect the optic nerve on one side, you cause ipsilateral blindness. If you affect at the optic chiasma, the central portion of optic chiasma, you get by temporal hemianopia. So you remember the optic chiasma is carrying fibers from nasal parts of the retina, both sides. And these are carrying information from temporal part of the visual fields on both sides. So if you injure fibers at the optic chiasma, you lose vision at both temporal fields. That's why you're calling it by temporal hemianopia. Then injury at the optic tract or optic radiation, you're affecting fibers from the temporal part of the ipsilateral eye 
and the nasal fibers from the contralateral eye. So you'll get homonymous hemianopia because your ipsilateral nasal uh, visual field and contralateral temporal visual fields are affected. Then we have optic neuritis, which um, will cause circumferential blindness. So this is what we mean. I told you each eye has a visual field, okay? This visual field, the middle portion is a nasal field, nasal field, and the lateral are the temporal field, temporal field. So information from the nasal field go to the temporal part of the eye. From nasal field to temporal part. Then from temporal field, they go to nasal. From temporal, they go to nasal part of the retina. Then those that are coming from nasal part of retina decussate at the chiasma. But those that are coming from temporal part of retina do not decussate. Those that are coming from those that are coming from temporal part of the retina, if you follow, they don't decussate. They go to the lateral geniculate body. From lateral geniculate body, so this is your first, um, um, you can see here, then decussation at lateral geniculate body, then another neuron carries the information to the primary visual area. So what happens? If you have a lesion at A, at optic nerve, you're affecting from this visual field and from the nasal visual field. So you won't be able to see anything here. So you'll have monocular or ipsilateral blindness. So you can't see anything on the left visual field. Then if you have a lesion affecting the chiasma, so like a tumor in the pituitary gland, for example, affecting the chiasma, what's going to happen? You're affecting these nasal fibers that are coming here from here. So you won't see this temporal field. And you're also affecting these nasal fibers. You won't also see this temporal field. That's why we are calling it by temporal hemianopia when there's injury at optic chiasma. C is injury of the optic tract. So you just follow the nasal fibers decussate. Where did they come from? Here. And this is carrying information from this. Okay, so there's that. And then you injure here, you follow this one. It's carrying information from the nasal. So nasal on one side and temporal on one side. So you're affecting basically a visual field. So this right, this right. So you get right, homonymous, hemianopia. This one was by temporal because you're affecting temporal fields. But here there is nasal and temporal. But it's right portion of the visual field. That's why it's called um, right, homonymous, hemianopia. Then at D, there's usually macular sparing. So you'll still get right homonymous hemianopia if you affect optic radiation. Because these fibers are the same. If you follow, they're the same as these fibers here. So it's still right homonymous hemianopia. But there's macular sparing because the macula, the central portion of the visual field, um, gets different source of uh, blood supply. So it's usually spared. Then we go to the third um, cranial nerve, oculomotor nerve. Now, the nuclei of this nerve are located at the midbrain. When you take a cross-section of the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculi, that's where the nuclei of oculomotor nerve are located. So it has two nuclei. There's oculomotor nucleus, which is general somatic efferent. It's motor to the extraocular muscles, such as medial, superior, and inferior recti muscles. Then there's inferior oblique. So these four are skeletal muscles. But oculomotor nucleus also supplies the skeletal part of the beta palpebra superioris. The beta palpebra superioris is a muscle that opens the eye. It elevates the eyelid. It has a skeletal part and a smooth part. So the skeletal part is innervated by uh, oculomotor nerve from oculomotor nucleus. So these are the five muscles supplied from the oculomotor nucleus. Medial, superior, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, and the skeletal part of levator beta palpebra superioris. The second nuclei of oculomotor is Edinger Westphal, which is general visceral efferent, uh, mainly parasympathetic function. So this one supplies the sphincter pupillae muscle. Okay. It supplies the sphincter pupillae muscle as well as the, um, um, mainly supplying the sphincter pupillae muscle, actually. So we have the intracranial course of the oculomotor nerve. So the nuclei is located at the periaqueductal gray of the midbrain. So we said the midbrain at the level of superior colliculi. Periaqueductal gray is gray matter around the, uh, the aqueduct of Sylvius. Then the nerve will traverse the tegmentum, pierce the red nucleus. Then on medial part of substantia nigra, 
then we also see it medial to cerebral pedicle. So that's how it moves. So from periaqueductal gray, then traverse tegmentum, pierce red nuclei, you see it on the medial part of substantia nigra, medial to cerebral pedicle, then we see it in the interpedancular fossa between superior cerebellar and posterior cerebral arteries. After that, it goes to the lateral wall of, of cavernous sinus, sympathetic plexus around the internal carotid artery. Okay, and these sympathetic plexus are the ones supplying the smooth muscle part of levator palpebra superioris. So this is what we are saying. This is the cerebral aqueduct. This is the gray matter around it, periaqueductal gray. So this is your kilomotor nucleus. It goes to the tegmentum, pierces the red nucleus, then medial to substantia nigra. This substantia nigra. Medial to cerebral peduncle, this is your cerebral peduncle. Then we sit in the interpeduncular fossa between superior cerebellar artery and posterior cerebral. Then it comes, goes to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and then enters the superior orbital fissure, dividing into two, an upper and a lower division. You can appreciate oculomotor on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Then the extra ocular, uh, extracranial cause, it passes through the superior orbital fissure together with trochlear, um, ophthalmic, abducens, and ophthalmic vein. Okay, so it passes through superior orbital fissure together with these structures, and then in the orbit, it will pass through the common tendinous ring. This is a tendinous ring that is formed by the extraocular muscles. After it has passed through this ring, it divides into a superior and an inferior division. The inferior division will supply medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. This inferior division also carries parasympathetic fibers to the ciliary ganglion. Through the, uh, from the ciliary ganglion, then the short ciliary nerve will carry the information to ciliary muscle to cause accommodation and to the sphincter pupillae to constrict the pupil. So the parasympathetic fibers will follow the inferior division into the ciliary ganglion. Postganglionic fibers will be carried by short ciliary nerve to the ciliary muscles to cause accommodation and to sphincter pupillae to cause constriction of the pupil. Then the superior division of the oculomotor will supply superior rectus and the skeletal muscle of skeletal part of levator palpebra superioris. So this is your superior division to superior rectus and levator palpebra superioris, the skeletal part. This is your inferior division to these muscles, inferior oblique, medial rectus, and inferior rectus. And it also gives, it goes to the ciliary ganglion, then short ciliary nerves will go and innervate ciliary muscles to cause accommodation and the sphincter pupillae to cause constriction of the pupils. So what are the sites of injury of the kilometer nerve? If you have diminished blood supply in the midbrain, for example, by a clot in the mesencephalic branch of posterior cerebral artery, so you're not supplying the midbrain. The kilomotor nerve, that's where it originates, so it will be affected. That's in conditions like Weber syndrome. If you have aneurysm of posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar artery, when these arteries enlarge, remember kilomotor nerve is passing through posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar. So it can be compressed there when these arteries have an aneurysm. Tumor of the hypothalamus getting into the interpeduncular fossa. So you need to know the cause of this nerve to understand where are the sites of injury. It passes through the cavernous sinus on the lateral wall, so a thrombus in the cavernous sinus will affect it. A tumor of the meninges, okay, because it has to pierce the meninges. Then we see it in the orbit, so a tumor within the orbit. Remember, it enters the orbit through superior orbital fissure. So what are the features of oculomotor palsy? There's tosis. What's tosis? It's drooping eyelid. Why does the eyelid droop? Because of skeletal part of levator palpebra is innervated by oculomotor nerve. So when there's paralysis, you get tosis. Then there's lateral strabismus. Remember, um, medial rectus causes adduction of the eyeball, and it's by oculomotor. Lateral rectus is innervated by abducens, LR6, lateral rectus abducens. Superior oblique is innervated by trochlea. Okay, so the muscles that are innervated by oculomotor, medial rectus, inferior rectus, okay, superior rectus, they cause medial movement of the eyeball. But since there's oculomotor palsy, there's paralysis of these muscles, the lateral rectus and superior oblique will act unopposed. So you get lateral strabismus. So the eyeball is on the lateral aspect of the eye. Okay. Then midriasis is when the pupil dilates because of paralysis of sphincter pupillae. Remember we said from the ciliary ganglion, short ciliary nerve causes 
as um, constriction of the people, but in oculomotor palsy, you can't constrict. 